my take on this is what you're gonna have to do with me guys so mr sadiq he's got slightly different views and you'll you'll realize or if you realized already this job everybody has different ways of doing things and it drives everybody nuts doesn't it so there's a couple of questions in this so complete denture second impressions the way i do it and the way i'd like you guys to do it so this this slide's been lifted straight off to mr sadiq's one so and basically what you're trying to do is just make sure you don't fight the muscles. Now, we did this on primary impressions a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? So was it longer ago than that? You're supposed to know these muscles. And this is why we taught you anatomy in the second year and everybody's forgotten it because nobody told you why you needed to know it. But it doesn't matter. So I gloss over that. So you need to know these muscles. So if you go beyond any of these muscles, that's where you start to fight and the muscles will always win. And I just shove the denture back um, to where the muscles are passive. Um, so overextension is probably the big mistake, second impressions. Why is overextension a big problem? So you guys got chip in there. So why is it a problem? Why are second impressions overextended frequently? Come on, it's interactive, guys. I sat and wrote this this morning, eight o'clock or some of it. So why is overextension a biggest, the biggest issue you get with second impressions? Somebody has the guess. You guys know because we did this two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Because usually the primary impression is overextended, so the sec or the special tray isn't um, modified well enough. So then when we take the secondary impression, that one is also overextended. Exactly. So the technicians will, unless you say otherwise, extend your custom tray, special tray, to the extension of your primary, because you haven't told them it's overextended and how much by. Now, I think if you look at the last tutorial we did. I had some pictures on there showing the overextension you get with primaries. So, yeah, so that's why. So, I mean, I see this all the time. People use a special trade. Let's say the biggest culprits are qualified dentists. And I've spoken to various nurses over various years and dentists qualified will take a special tray out the bag. Because it's called a special trade, they just use it. They put adhesive in it and just use it. So if you don't recognize that, that's why overextension is a problem. And then it keeps going to so overextended primary, which is good. Overextended secondary, which is really bad. The rims are now overextended and unstable. The trine's overextended and unstable, and so is the fit. So by the time you get to fit, you end up hacking everything back to make it stable. So you need to recognize primaries should be overextended, the secondaries mustn't be. So we're going to come back. This is this is a case that I see treated a couple of years ago, and I think these slides are on the PowerPoint. So this just shows you, you can see in the upper left three region, there's a root. So this lady came to me. Um, wanting dentures and she had this retained root and she had recurrent swelling so that was dealt with so we did the primary impression sent her away come back in a couple of months the root wasn't that big let her heal up so these are the primaries from one case so you can see i think you can see it's quite clear here to me anyway you can see stretched tissues there and on the other side to a lesser degree that's where the primary impression has stretched all the tissues out of the way but you can see from this particularly the upper, there's more overextension on the upper left here than the upper right. Because some people say, well, just make your custom tray two millimeters short of the primary impression extension. Well, that won't work here because it two millimeters short of the initial impression on the upper left will actually be massively overextended still. So that actually doesn't work. So you've got it, you can't control the overextension. I don't think you can control the degree of overextension of primary. You just can't do it. This ends up in a lecture, doesn't it? When I do it like this, hey, what does it matter? So you can't do it. So basically you need to recognize the overextension, which is what you've said. I got a feeling we showed you these videos in the last tutorial, but I'm gonna make you watch them again because you're a captive audience and it serves a purpose. So this is just me talking over getting their extension. This, I don't think this is the same case. It doesn't matter. It's the same principle every single time you do it. Here's a special tray for the case we're talking about at the moment. You can see the extension of the old post stands here. If you're not careful, for the lab, we'll copy that. So make sure you tell them where you want to extend the post stand to. You can see this wonderful special tray made by Dominica. The important thing is the peripheries are really thin and it's clear in the free. Now, these are my guesses at three null notches. I might be wrong and I'm going to check this in the mouth, but you'd expect to find three. But you can see how short we are of the sulcus here. So if your tray is much bigger than that, and as I said before, the underside of the tray should look like a denture. The only place we're going to green stick this, and you'll see this later on, is I'm going to green stick the back edge to get some compression, and I'm going to green stick 
and the two tuberosity regions, and that's it. But you'll see that in a future video. So nice thin tray, vertical hand to clear the lip, no distortion. We'll use this later on today. Right, as I said last time, that underextension of palate is so common. If you don't tell a technician to make the tray further back than the old denture, if the old denture's made an indent in the palate, it'll always come out on the model. The technicians will always assume. So you, you need to always check your trays before the patient comes in, in the surgery or on the clinic. If they're underextended, um, you need to be aware that you're gonna have to sort that out. Um, and if they're overextended, you trim them back before the patient comes in. It just, it just looks better. And now we're gonna do the lower, same thing. Except I forget to mention the finger rests on this. And here's the lower, same again, follow the outline. Um, and across here, it's quite small, maybe 10, seven millimeters is a bit small. So I've decided to get a gauge on this to show you guys. So how big is this tray across the front? Less than a centimeter. And that's probably as big as it's going to end up. Okay, so there's the tray. The hand is upright. It must be upright on the lower to clear the lip. You want any influence of the lip on the sulcus, otherwise you're going to distort it. Again, you can see here, the difference between the extension of the primary impression and where the tray is significantly shorter. And again, three little notches, extend into the sulcus. Now I can't be sure this isn't full extension, so these areas will be green stick chair side. So you can see again, fit surface of the denture matches the fit surface of the tray. So if your tray looks much bigger than that, it's probably too bulky. So it'll be green sticking here and here, and that's probably it, but you'll see later on, we'll do a future video. Okay. It's not a future video because you're going to see it in a minute. Okay. So just look at this. It's the same patient. This is the primary impression on the left, different patient from the one I showed you before. This is the blue trays one. We can see the outlines where the tray goes to, and the peripheries are significantly less. You'll see at the end when we show the photos and photographs. But if your trays are filling the uh, primary cast, just you're going to have to trim them back. Now, what you didn't see before, I've got some videos just showing you what they look like in the mouth. So, as I said before, and you need to remember this, if your trays look bigger than a normal denture, they're probably overextended. So just look at the fit surface. And if the, unless the patient's denture is massively underextended, compare your special tray to your patient's denture by looking at the fit surface. If they're similar, you're probably in the right ballpark. If your new tray is massive compared to the present denture, and the present denture is not significantly overextended, you've got problems coming down the line. So this is checking the tray in the mouth. So this is an upper and a lower. Trying this in now to make sure we've got three little leaf and we're just slightly short the peripheries. Cool. Good. Okay. As ever, Radio 2 in the background, embarrassing for me, but what the hell. So check them in. Make sure that if they're significantly short, you know you're going to have to add green stick in certain places. If it's about bang on, do you really want to change the shape? And the lower. The Even more important, the lower. Again, use a mirror to attract the tissues. The tray. The tray should just be passive. You shouldn't move at all. Mm -hmm. Press on the finger rest. There you go. Stable tray base. You can see here the lip was pushed out by the hand. We have trouble. So there we go. Okay. So how do you know if it was overextended? The lower, what would happen? Somebody shout an answer. Upper is less of an issue, but if the lower is overextended, when you try it in like that, what's likely to happen when you push the tray down in the mouth? The patient will feel pain and it will also start to kind of just spring back out. Right. It just rises up. I mean, sometimes you get pain, that's, it's have to be significantly overextended for that, but you're right, it could cause pain. But if it just bounces back at you, you've got overextension. So what are you going to do then? Do you start adding green stick and border molding? So no, what are you going to do it. if it bounces back? How are you going to check it? You I just keep to... trimming it until it fits how, nice. How, how do you know where to trim it? How do you know where to trim it? Yeah, how do you know where it's overextended? Um, do you add pressure paste? Uh, you can, but it's very few people do that. I mean, I, I have to say, I've forgotten to put a slide in this, so I'll add one to it. Uh, <laughs> what can you use instead? Anybody know? You're right, you're on the right track. You want to use something to indicate where you've got overextension. So what do we use instead of pressure paste? Perhaps you guys don't know. Does anybody know? 
Can somebody shout something then. Shout louder. Did somebody say silicon in their mousy voice? You're absolutely right. That's the answer. You put silicon inside. So you don't use adhesive. You put silicon inside the tray and you seat the tray again. You board and mold it and see where the tray is showing through. Where the tray shows through is where we've got overextension. Um, yes, that's what you do. So now there's a view fairly widely held that's been like it for years that some people will border mold the entire periphery of a special tray custom tray with green stick and the and loads of people do this so it's not wrong but if you're going to do that and the video that's on the blackboard by mr Siliki shows that what have you got to do with your special tray that you can actually green stick the whole periphery Because I didn't realise until a few years ago, this is what we were taught to do as students. I don't think I did it, but anyway. So if you're going to green stick that entire periphery of custom trays, special trays, what have you got to do with the trays beforehand? Because when I showed the tray in the mouth just now, it's just about where I wanted the extension, wasn't it? Particularly on the upper, you could see labelling, it was about right. So if you want to do a green stick periphery on the whole tray, what's the tray got to look like in the mouth? Underextended. It's got, you're absolutely right. It's got to be massively underextended by at least two millimeters everywhere to make room for the green stick. Now, if you're a slick green sticker, can you say that? And you're really good with green stick, that's okay. When I was a student, there was, a, there was an old guy who used to be on clinic. He used to grab your special trays. We used to have a grinding wheel on clinic and he would hack two millimeters off every single tray to make it short so you could add green stick around the entire tray. That's OK, but it means one is you've got to recognise that you've got to chop the tray back. And two is you've got to be really quite good and proficient with green stick to do all that green sticking around the entire tray. Now, if you're good with green stick and you hack the tray back, absolutely fine. If you're not, you're making a lot of work for yourself and potentially making it quite difficult. So it's not wrong to do it. It's just technically more tricky to do it. And if you've taken a good primary and your tray's extended properly, I just think it's an awful lot of work that you might not need to do. So that's the view. So I do it one way and lots of people do it another way. The other way is not wrong. You just got to recognize the fact that if your tray is not significantly underextended and you're not making room for green stick, you will end up with overextension. So this is the way I do it and the way you guys will do it with me. So the materials, zinc oxide, that's favorite. Loads and loads of people use silicon because lots of practices have got it and not many practices seem to have zinc oxide. I'm doing my best to bring it back into fashion. I don't know if I'm making any progress, but I will keep going. Um, and the last one is alginate. So guys, interaction, and the answer's not in the slides. So you can have to tell me. So the, for the, for, so the first case, what sort of special tray are we gonna have made? What are we asking the lab to make? I need an answer now. So who's gonna say something? What's your prescription for a special tray for uh, when you're planning to use zinc oxide eugenol? There's only two options for tray design, isn't there? So what are they? Shall I tell you? Space, Go on. Space, space perforated or not spaced and not perforated? Exactly. Yeah. So which one we go for zinc oxide eugenol? Close fit, non perforated. Second one, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So for silicon, lots of people will go for um, spaced and perforated, which is okay. If you're gonna use silicon, absolutely fine. If you're alginate, you're gonna to have to use spaced perforated again. So we've got a supplementary question at the end. So what's some pros and cons? So what's good about zinc oxide eugenol? One answer. Somebody give me an answer. There's a couple of answers actually. I'll do it. It's stable. It's not water based, so it doesn't dry out. It doesn't distort. So zinc oxide eugenol is brilliant in that respect. It's potentially mucocompressive, which is no bad thing. And it's a slight fringe benefit. If you get deficiencies in it, you can add zinc oxide eugenol to zinc oxide eugenol. So if you've got a deficiency in the impression, you can add a tiny bit more. It's quite risky because you can end up with it overlaying the rest of the impression. So it's dimensionally stable. Um, what's the downside to zinc oxide? Anybody? I think you're doing human disease at the moment, aren't you? Oral med? No, you're doing oral med, aren't you? So there's a clue there. Zinc oxide eugenol, one potential downside. 
It's a very small group of patients. Does it cause irritation or allergic reaction or something? Uh, it's not an allergic reaction, but you're, you're sort of semi-warm. Keep going. Um, if I said the patient had uh, been given some medications that had oral side effects, big clue. Oh, does it, does it, um, does it quite, does it stick to the mouth if you have like dry mouth for example absolutely yeah it's quite it's quite irritating saliva is great as a lubricant and zinc oxide you know, has got potentially got a, a slight burning sensation so if you've got a patient with dry mouth drug induced or otherwise it's not very nice and i've never yet found a patient that i've had to treat with zinc oxide i couldn't use but you just need to make be aware of it if they've got a, a dry mouth to, to any degree just give them a, a, a quick rinse of water before you take the impression. It's usually absolutely fine. But you just tell them it it's like a chemical burn. It's not, but it feels really quite, sometimes it feels quite warm to patients. It takes lovely impressions. So pros and cons of silicon, people. Pros are it's dimensionally stable. Uh, it flows quite nicely and some people get great results with it. Um, and there's varying opinions on whether you use medium body or light body, probably depends on whether you've got a space or a close fit tray. Um, the downsides to some of them are significantly hydrophobic. Now the one we use on clinic that's green, I won't mention the name, is much more hydrophobic than the blue version, both light bodied. So if you're gonna use silicon, you need um, to sort of dry the tissues a bit, especially if you've got one that's particularly hydrophobic. And alginate, um, pros and cons of alginate. The pros of alginate are it's easy to use, the cons are, by definition, most edentulous impressions are going to be fairly thin. And if you've got thin alginate, it's going to prone to the distortion. It'll dry out and it'll distort and potentially tear. So um, you need quite a big spacer and you need to pour your impressions fairly quickly if you can use alginate. Um, I virtually never use alginate for edentulous impressions for those reasons. OK, so. Now, so my preference, this is how I would green stick. And I think there's some audio on this, so you just watch this. Always tell the patient where it's going to be warm. They're way less likely to jump. So that's all I do is that part of the lingual socket because the tray is about where I want it. Okay. And now I think there's a, a brief run on the upper. Always do the pallet first. The pallet always looks like that. Partials or completes. It's the width of the sulcus as much as the depth that matters. So that's some green stick on the outside of the tray. One side at a time, guys. One side at a time, it's just easier. And then insert. Right. The only bit I didn't say on there is excuse the mandible left to right, but we'd have done it. Okay. And then zinc oxide usually sticks to everything, including the patient's face. So the messy you are, the further you need to spread Vaseline around the outside of the mouth so you don't get zinc oxide stuck everywhere. And don't use the fingers and the finger rests in this case. This is, makes a big difference. If you don't have finger rests on lower trays, you can end up potentially spreading the buccal sulcus with your fingers. So watch the way you use the finger rest. And it's the same on the primers when you guys are using the Shotlander trays on clinic. Same process. Yeah, 
space of that that sticks to everything. Sometimes you pinch the floor of the mouth underneath it. You get the tongue moving and it comes out. So it's sandwiched between the trays sometimes. You can see the finger rests hold the tray down. Now, what are you guys looking at here? What's the significance of that and that? What makes other impressions? What's that all about? That is the tissues overlying the coronoid process. You can see you've got a lovely indentation. You can imagine coronoid process. Tissues covering the cor coronoid process have squeezed the impression material and the green stick in those areas there. So that's really important. This is when you get mandibular movements for, sorry, yeah, mandibular movements for all magazine impressions. You just want to make sure you've got those areas squeezed quite nicely. Okay. So why have we got two zinc oxides, just a difference in, same materials, just different the way the camera's taking the photographs. Difference in size of the buccal flanges. So why have we got different size flanges? Because the mandibular movements on the photograph on the left have squeezed the sulcus to make it quite narrow. The mandibular movements on the sulcus on the right image have not squeezed it so much, so you've got a wider buccal flange. Why does that matter? Because the buccal tissue seal against the outside of the denture. So if you end up with, a, um, if you look at the case on, on this side here, if we ended up having really skinny buccal flanges or the lab inadvertently chopped the buccal flanges down, like so, you get less buccal seal with the cheek against the denture. So that's why you wanna maintain the buccal flange with assuming you've had the patient do the mandibular movements left to right. So buccal flange width matters, but you need to get the green stick sorted out so the patient's exposed in the tongue, uh, the chin left to right, and do the same thing when you take the impressions. And in that case, you should see the whole border is formed in whatever impression material you choose to use, whether it's zinc oxide, whether it's silicon or alginate. Buccal flange width matters. Don't make them skinny if the patient's got a wide buccal corridor. And just to show you the difference, and this is the difference, same case, same arches, primary impressions, secondary impressions. Sulcal width matters massively, as does the sulcal depth. So when the lab pour the impressions up, you need to say to the lab, preserve the buccal sulcal depth and the sulcal width. Otherwise you lose the crucial, and this, this, this sulcus here is gold dust. You need the width and the depth you've recorded. Now the lab will commonly here, and it's okay on the primaries, they cut the excess plaster away if it's easy to make the tray. You don't want them to do that on the secondary impressions and the cast from them. So you have to tell the lab, preserve the buckle, sulcal depth and the sulcal width. Otherwise you potentially lose loads of retention and they don't know, and I didn't used to know as a technician, what the significance of the buckle flange width is. But it does mean you've got to record it properly. You can't just take the impression. You've actually got to make sure that the patient's excursing left to right to do it. And that, people, is it. So that's second impressions. So if you're going to do full peripheral green sticking, you need to make sure the tray is short. Otherwise, have we got a different picture now on the screen? Anyway, we're finished now. So are there any questions? My guess is there probably isn't, but there might be. Anybody want to say anything? If not, that's it, guys. So all you do on the laboratory sheet is request lab pour the models, preserve sulcal depth, sulcal width, and construct occlusal rims. That's it. So, guys, I will then leave it there.